Hello, and welcome to the press webinar for the IEA's new in-depth review of the energy policies of Norway. I'm Jethro Mullen, Editor-in-Chief in the IEA, IEA's communications team, and I'm joined today by IEA Executive Director, Dr. Fatih Birol, Norway's Minister of Petroleum and Energy, His Excellency Terje Orsland, and IEA Energy Analyst, Divya Reddy, the lead author of the new report. After opening remarks by Dr. Birol, Ms. Reddy will present the key findings of the report. Mr. Orsland will then provide his response to the findings. After that, we will have time for questions from the media. For the journalists taking part in this press webinar, we invite you to submit your questions via the Q&A function in the Zoom. You can do this at any point during the presentation starting now. If there are any questions that we don't manage to get to during the allotted Q&A time, uh, we will uh, respond to you uh, as promptly as possible from the press office. With that, I'll hand over to our Executive Director, Dr. Birol. So thank you very much, uh, Mr. Mullen, and uh, good afternoon to uh, Mr. Minister, uh, dear colleagues, uh, greetings from the International Energy Agency uh, headquarters. Uh, dear uh, as International Energy Agency, we are conducting peer reviews of our member countries' energy policies since our create, creation, many, many years. And it is uh, one of the conditions of being a member of the International Energy Agency. These in-depth reviews are uh, carried out every five to six uh, years, and it covers the entire energy system. And uh, here, uh, I would like to say uh, that uh, we focus on different uh, topics, uh, but in the case uh, of Norway, uh, our in-depth review focused on the energy security and energy system uh, transformation. The basic idea of uh, the, uh, this in-depth reviews uh, is governments to learn from each other, learning from their best practices and uh, therefore uh, revise uh, their energy policies. And we will be always a team of experts from different governments. In the case of uh, Norway, we uh, had our uh, review in January, last January, and the team leader was from Danish government, and the members of the team were from Canada, Estonia, Ireland, Portugal, Switzerland, United Kingdom, and the United States. My colleague, Mrs. Uh, Divya Reddy, was uh, also in the team. I would like to thank the government of Norway, especially uh, the, uh, the Ministry of uh, Petroleum Energy for the excellent uh, cooperation uh, we had throughout the review process. During our uh, review, we not only talked with the uh, Ministry of uh, Petroleum and Energy, but uh, the team had discussions, uh, interviews, uh, meetings with other ministries, regulators, energy companies, system operators, consumer groups, academia, and NGOs. And I would like to thank them also for their time. Uh, I am uh, very happy to launch this uh, report uh, for Norway, a country which plays a, a critical role in terms of the European and global energy security, but at the same time, uh, one of the leaders of the global energy transitions. Now, a few words before we go to uh, our findings and the recommendations to Norwegian government, a few words about the global context and the role of Norway uh, there. Russia's invasion uh, of uh, Ukraine once again reminded us how critical is energy security and uh, what a permanent future of our energy policies are. And the uh, skyrocketing energy prices from 
South Africa to Norway, from Norway to India, from India to United States, around the world, reminded us once again the critical importance of market stability. When it comes to oil markets, uh, the, uh, the, uh, the sanctions uh, imposed on uh, Russia, the country that invaded uh, Ukraine, plus a strong oil demand recovery, including in uh, China, and the declining OPEC plus uh, uh, spare production capacity are uh, ringing the alarm bells for oil markets. In terms of gas, in Europe, we are experiencing unprecedented uncertainty in the uh, gas markets. And the, I believe uh, this winter will be one of the most challenging winters uh, in the European uh, uh, history in terms of uh, energy. And therefore, I thought it is uh, right to highlight the Norwegians' positive and timely contribution to European and global energy uh, security. E before going to say a few words on the Norweg Norwegian gas and uh, Europe, let me remind you that the at the IEA, why we believe that the energy security is uh, once again very important for uh, all the countries around the world, and it requires immediate response in many areas. We are uh, well aware of the, the another energy crisis, which is the climate crisis. And Contrary to the false narrative that the energy transitions come at the expense of the energy security, we believe in the long run, clean energy technologies offer the best solutions to address our energy security uh, problems. And here, it is uh, again uh, encouraging to see that the, some countries are uh, taking uh, steps in terms of accelerating their clean energy investments. A few words on the uh, Norwegian gas uh, to uh, Europe. I would like to uh, highlight the role of, positive role of uh, Norway to support energy security uh, during these difficult days, supplying additional gas to Europe. Some of our, our Norwegian friends would know, uh, the colleagues in uh, Oslo and the Norwegian media, uh, the Norwegian friends around the world, I am highlighting at every possible occasion how Europe should be thankful to Norway uh, as the country increased it is a, a gas uh, deliveries to Europe under difficult conditions. Only the day for yesterday, during the G7 summit in Elmau, to G7 leaders, uh, I have highlighted uh, the critical importance of Norway as a reliable supplier to uh, Europe and uh, uh, beyond. Our latest data indicates that Norwegian pipeline supplies were more than 20%, in other words, 10 BCM higher compared to the pipeline deliveries from Russia in the first half of 2022. This is, of course, uh, excellent uh, news uh, for uh, all of us, and this is something that we are very happy to comment uh, uh, Norwegian uh, government. We are also uh, very happy to see uh, that the, while Norway is uh, fulfilling a, a, a very important uh, uh, obligation as a major oil and gas exporting uh, country, we also see that the, there are also uh, uh, physical limitations that the, what Norway can uh, do. 
and we know uh, that the, the, uh, the in terms of the exports they are uh, the running close to their name paid capacity uh, for now so many thanks to norway for this a few words on the uh, clean energy side i would like to highlight two in my view exemplary efforts of norway one on carbon capture and storage the uh, how uh, the norway shows a leadership in terms of uh, ccs is uh, critical very important and uh, pushing the ccs in the uh, agenda and in the real life since 1996 is uh, something to be uh, underlined and norway in my view is a leader uh, in terms of the cc deployment and the home to several companies with CCS uh, uh, expertise. Longshim project, uh, uh, the, uh, with this project, Norway will develop a full-scale CCS chain and will be uh, able to store uh, CO2 volumes from other European uh, uh, carbon capture projects as such. It is a critical uh, one. And I really commend Norway for the uh, uh, determined and since years uh, on the uh, CCS uh, front, even those days and the years when the interest in the CCS uh, weakened, Norway was always there to continue to support CCS as a key clean energy technology. Norway is uh, the second technology I want to mention is the electric uh, uh, cars a clear leader in electric cars with the highest share of uh, electric cars in the world, driven by uh, finance, uh, financial instruments, uh, namely a taxation uh, system, well-established uh, taxation system. We will hear more about this uh, shortly. Uh, last year, uh, the IEA made a, a roadmap to net zero for the world uh, until 2050, and the, uh, the, the milestones we put uh, for the global EV sales uh, uh, in 2030 has been already passed uh, by Norway, overreached uh, uh, by Norway uh, even uh, today. So uh, as uh, we also know that the, it is uh, the, uh, I think, uh, very interesting uh, in my view, view to uh, underline that Norway is pushing a technology which will reduce the uh, oil demand for which Norway is one of the key suppliers. I think I wanted to uh, mention this. Uh, before uh, passing the floor uh, to my uh, colleague uh, Divya Reddy for giving us some of the findings of our, uh, and, uh, our uh, in-depth uh, review, I would like to say uh, that the uh, we work at the IEA with many major oil and gas producers in Americas, in Asia, in Africa, uh, uh, elsewhere. And uh, uh, as an uh, important oil and gas producer, the Norwegian uh, government's efforts to uh, being a, a strong, driver of reaching climate goals, global climate goals, is uh, uh, commendable. And uh, I would like to just uh, once again uh, underline this. Now I would like to pass the floor to my colleague uh, Divya uh, Reddy to give us uh, some of the key findings. Uh, thank you, Dr. Biro, and good afternoon to you, uh, Minister Aslan. So I'll provide a brief overview of some of the key findings from the um, IEA report on Norway's energy policy. So to start with uh, setting the scene, looking at Norway's climate targets, um, under its enhanced NDC, under the Paris Agreement, Norway committed to reducing greenhouse gas emissions by at least 50% and up to 55% from 1990 levels by 2030. And under its uh, Climate Change Act from 2017, it established by law Norway's a, a target to reduce uh, emissions by 90 to 95 percent, uh, excluding carbon sinks, which is um, uh, defined as achieving a low emission society by 2050. 
Um, so to meet those ambitious targets, Norway does have considerable work ahead, especially considering that the power sector is almost uh, nearly emissions free already. And so in reductions need to be found in other sectors, especially in the transport and industry sectors. Um, emissions reductions to, to date don't track um, with putting the country um, toward meeting its 2030 targets through domestic reductions. Uh, in 2020, Norway's energy-related CO2 emissions were 10% higher than they were in 2000. And Norway relied heavily on um, international offset mechanisms and flexibility mechanisms within the EU ETS to, to meet its 2020 target. That said, between, more recently between 2010 and 2020, um, Norwegian energy-related CO2 emissions fell by 9%. Um, with significant reductions seen across all sectors, with the exception of the industry sector. Um, importantly, Norway has also started to decouple its emissions growth from its economic growth. Um, between 2010 and 2020, energy-related CO, uh, sorry, between 2000 and uh, 2020, uh, energy-related CO2 emissions fell by 10%, whereas GDP grew by, by 30%. And in 2020, Norway had the sixth lowest um, emissions intensity uh, by GDP of all IEA countries. Um, from a policy perspective, as part of its uh, uh, participation in uh, the agreement on the European Economic Area, Norway uh, is part of the EU internal energy market and cooperates closely with the EU on all climate and energy matters. Um, Norway has an agreement with the EU to participate in EU climate legislation through 2030. So this includes the EU emissions trading scheme, the effort sharing regulation for non-ETS sectors, and the LULU-CF regulation. Um, domestically, the polluter pays principle is a cornerstone of the Norwegian policy framework on climate change. So uh, approximately 85% of all domestic GHG emissions fall either under the EU ETS or the a CO2 tax or both. Um, in 2022, so this year, the CO2 tax rate is around 766 Norwegian kroner per ton. That's uh, the equivalent to around 60, 76 euros. Um, and the government announced that it would increase the CO2 tax to 2,000 Norwegian kroner by 2030. So those levels of CO2 pricing are robust from an international pers perspective and can drive meaningful reductions um, in the relevant sectors. Uh, but even a carbon price of 200 euros per ton may not be sufficient to drive emissions to the level needed to meet Norway's climate targets, which suggests that supplemental measures may be needed in some areas. Now turning to um, energy efficiency, um, Norway has, for the past decade, or uh, if not longer, been decoupling energy consumption from, um, from uh, economic growth. Uh, on a sectoral basis, industry was the largest energy consuming sector, followed by buildings uh, and then transport. Um, and based on a 2016 white paper, Norway's main target for um, energy efficiency is to achieve a 30% improvement in energy intensity of the economy overall. Uh, by 2030 compared to 2015. Uh, as of 2020, the uh, reduction in energy intensity from 2015 was 6%. Um, ENOVA is Norway's main provider of financial support for projects uh, on energy uh, efficiency across various sectors as well as projects targeting households and consumers. In the industry sector, um, between 20, 2003 and 2018, ENOVA provided support for projects um, that improved energy efficiency or for the replacement of fossil fuels with renewable energy. But since 2019, the uh, ENOVA's uh, mandate has shifted more specifically to measures targeting greenhouse gas emissions reductions um, rather than directly targeting energy efficiency. Uh, in the building sector, the uh, Norway has a target to reduce energy use in, in existing buildings by 10 terawatt hours from 2015 levels by 2030. Um, the main uh, policy measure is the adoption of building codes. And since uh, 2016, the government has banned the installation of fossil fuel heating systems and the use of heating uh, uh, oil since 2020. So most buildings nowadays have electric heating systems. Um, so overall, though, Norway has been, has been blessed with affordable and abundant energy and has uh, started to decouple emissions, uh, energy consumption and economic growth. 
um, there are still substantial cost savings that could be achieved from, from reducing, uh, further reducing energy consumption in Norway. Now turning to the power sector, Norway has an almost entirely renewables-based power system, 98% of, uh, of generation in 2020 came from renewable sources, uh, of which the bulk was hydro at 92%. Uh, Norway also has the most electrified economy in the IEA, um, which covers almost half of the country's final co energy consumption. In particular, in the residential sector, um, around 80% of uh, final demand is met by electricity, and in the industry sector, nearly half at 46%. Um, Norway is also well integrated in the Nordic and European electricity markets. It's historically served as a net exporter to its neighbors and is one of the largest exporters in Europe. Um, all that said, Still, the planned electrification of uh, the economy to meet climate targets, as well as the introduction of new sectors, um, is expected to significantly drive up power demand in the coming years. So Norway will require an additional uh, build-out of renewable generation capacity. Some of that can come from expansion of hydro capacity, including upgrades to existing plants that are already underway. Um, but there still will be a requirement to find new sources of generation uh, to support faster electricity demand growth, especially if Norway plans to maintain its position as a net exporter in the Nord Nordic market. Um, plans for offshore wind will, will certainly help, though. but given the, the long lead times associated with projects, as well as the relative nascency of the sector in Norway, it's more of a midterm prospect post-2030. Uh, in the interim, onshore wind can play a bigger role, um, including through an updated licensing regime that was recently released by the government. Um, and the, and the co country will also benefit from expansion of the, the grid or to help Sweden enforce its grid, which um, can help surplus generation in the north of the country more easily make its way south. Um, in addition, the use of flexibility mechanisms to balance the grid will also be needed, especially as more rene uh, variable renewables uh, is introduced into the system. And Norway's existing and quite sizable uh, hydro storage capacity provides a good basis for that. So now looking um, at the transport sector, which covers around 21% of Norwegian energy demand. Um, uh, as Dr. Birrell mentioned, Norway has had a, a long-standing and quite well-known policy on promotion of electric vehicles. Uh, so fossil fuel cars are subject to a high registration tax on purchase, as well as a CO2 tax and a road use tax for gasoline and diesel. At the same time, zero emissions vehicles are heavily subsidized, including through an exemption on a value-added tax, exemption from a one-off registration tax, as well as reduced um, fees for things like toll roads, ferries, and parking. Um, as a result, Norway has um, the highest share of EVs, a, uh, including both uh, pure battery and plug-in hybrids in the IEA, um, both in terms of car fleet at 22% in 2021 and in terms of new car sales at 85% in 2021. Um, Norway has also made um, progress in electrifying other vehicle types. Close to 4% of light commercial uh, vehicles are, are fully electric, uh, while 6.7% of buses are electric. And um, Norway introduced the first uh, electric ferry in 2015. So while Norway's uh, growth in EV sales is unquestionably uh, impressive, the government should also ensure that, that the measures, which are quite costly for the, for the public budget, are achieving true displacement of internal combustion engines and driving sustainable cost-effective reductions both in um, road transport energy consumption as well as emissions. So now looking at, at the oil and gas sector, which is Norway's largest sector um, based on value added, revenues, investments, um, and export value. Uh, so therefore the sector plays a crucial role in the Norwegian economy and in financing the Norwegian welfare state. Um, the country's export revenues from the petroleum sector were estimated to be uh, 80 billion euros in uh, 2021 and are expected to double this year based on the high oil and gas price environment. Uh, the government pension fund, um, financed by revenues from oil and gas production, uh, finances public pension expenditures uh, and is meant to provide benefits both to um, current and future generations uh, from petroleum revenues as well as protect the country's economy from long-term volatility in oil and gas revenues. 
Um, the size of Norway's energy surplus is significant. In 2020, the country produced 10 times more oil and 20 time, 21 times more natural gas than it needed for its domestic use. And that trend has been increasing over the past two decades. Um, and then as, as Dr. Birrell mentioned, Norway has for decades been a stable and reliable source of oil and gas for the global market and in particular to Europe, a uh, position that gains more importance um, now given Russia's invasion of Ukraine. Um, and then with relatively low production costs and relatively low emissions intensity of upstream operations, Norway is also uh, well positioned as a provider of oil and gas to the world market, even over the longer term. Um, nonetheless, the government should also plan for a scenario in which oil demand falls faster than expected, given a number of uh, net zero pledges from countries around the world. Um, in terms of national emissions, um, the oil and gas sector is still a sizable contributor, um, accounting for uh, around a quarter of the country's total greenhouse gas emissions. Um, the industry has ambitions to further reduce emissions in the upstream petroleum sector by up to 40% um, from 2005 levels by 2030 and to become net zero emissions by 2050. Uh, and while some of the planned emissions reductions can be achieved through Norway's participation in the EU ETS and the carbon tax, steeper cuts will be needed to meet both the 2030 and the 2050 climate targets. Um, implying that the next tranche of emissions reductions from the sector will be both more challenging and more costly. Um, results can come not only from the escalating carbon price, but also from additional electrification of uh, uh, offshore platforms and through technologies such as CCS in the longer term. Um, but these options need to be thoroughly assessed um, with an eye not only to cost competitiveness, but also to the development of a number of planned new industries, including hydrogen, batteries, data centers, that will all also need to draw significant amounts of power from shore. And then finally, energy innovation will uh, clearly play an important role in Norway's energy transition, um, in particular to leverage uh, existing strengths of its energy sector into new areas, such as CCS, offshore wind, and hydrogen. Um, Again, as Dr. Birol mentioned, CCS has been a priority area for Norway's climate action. The Longship project, which is currently under construction, consists of two full-scale capture facilities and one storage facility in the North Sea. Um, and it aims to uh, also facilitate learning and cost reductions for future projects in an international perspective. Uh, in addition to several uh, pilot projects, there are currently two large-scale CCS projects already operating in Norway uh, and the one under development. And so Norway has, has really established itself as a leader, leading country for CCS deployment and has also uh, developed uh, a lot of uh, a number of companies with CCS expertise. Uh, the technology can notably play a role in decarbonizing the industry sector and to facilitate the development of low carbon hydrogen, as well as offer vast CO2 storage potential for other countries. Um, the Norwegian government also offers several R&D su related support measures for the development of low carbon hydrogen. The government introduced a hydrogen strategy in 2020, followed up by a hydrogen roadmap in 2021. And the roadmap includes signposts for the, um, the production and use of hydrogen in the 2025, 2030, and 2050 timeframes. Um, and an important point in the government strategy is to develop a coherent value chain um, to where production, distribution, and consumption are developed in, in parallel. So with that, I will hand the floor over back to Dr. Birol, who will wrap up with our um, key recommendations for the Norwegian government. Thank you very much. And uh, so let us uh, give you couple of recommendations uh, uh, we have for a betterment of Norwegian energy sector. But before that, uh, once again, I would like to uh, underline that we see Norway's uh, contribution to global energy security invaluable. And we recognize that the, uh, Norway is leader in several clean energy technologies and the Slide that my colleague, Mrs. Reddy, just showed you that the, the R&D 
spending, uh, uh, being the leader among IEA countries, in fact, leader with a big, big, big uh, difference to the second uh, country is a good uh, indicator uh, for that. Having said that, we have a couple of uh, suggestions uh, in uh, recommendations in our report. I chose for you four of them to bring to your attention. The first one is we believe Norwegian government needs to establish a national emission reduction strategies for key sectors to 2030 and 2050. And these should include specific targets. And also, uh, we also uh, would like to see what kind of uh, supporting policy measures uh, need to be implemented to reach those targets. This is number one. Number two, in addition to the carbon pricing uh, uh, incentive we have, the uh, Norwegian government may consider additional measures to achieve uh, reductions in uh, hard to abate and rather more expensive uh, emission reductions. And these are mainly in the industry sector. What kind of measures uh, we can have in addition to the carbon pricing? Third suggestion, uh, when we look at Norway and Norwegian electricity sector, electricity is key. And when we look at the, uh, in the next years to come, electricity is the future. Future in not only in Norway, but also in the world. But when it comes to uh, Norway, uh, how we can uh, facilitate uh, the uh, expansion of the low carbon electricity generation is an important issue. Therefore, one would like to see, we would like to see, in fact, a decarbonization strategy for electrification and also uh, as important as that, the how we can uh, strengthen the electricity grids. Fourth and the last recommendation uh, I chose uh, for you, there are many of uh, uh, recommendations that my colleague, Mrs. Reddy, and the team put together. Uh, we may uh, we may need to see some uh, stronger ambitions uh, in the jumpstart clean energy technologies, and uh, uh, those technologies may uh, have competitive advantages uh, for Norway, such as hydrogen, green speak, uh, CCS, and offshore wind huge experience of Norway in terms of offshore uh, energy and this time offshore wind. And finally, we work very closely with the uh, Norwegian uh, government, Norwegian industry, Norwegian civil society, academia, research institutes, and uh, others. We are uh, very much looking forward to continue to have this excellent uh, relationship. With this, I go back to my colleague, uh, Mr. Madam. Thank you, uh, Dr. Birrell and uh, Ms. Reddy for the presentation. We will now hear from Minister Orsland uh, for his thoughts on the IEA's review of Norway's policies. Uh, Minister Orsland, the floor is yours. Mr. Orsland, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, and dear colleagues. First of all, thank you to Dr. Fatih Birrell for this valuable uh, report. I really appreciate our close and constructive cooperation. The report reflects the many aspects of the Norwegian energy sector in an excellent way. Thank you also to the review team and to the Secretariat for all your hard work. Our relationship with the IEA is very important to us. Your work opens up for dialogue and reflections on current challenges. And we really appreciate the work you do in providing analysis, facts, and statistics, which is in uh, which is uh, invaluable in the current debate. This is uh, essential to understanding what is going on with the uncertainty we see today in the energy markets. 
the global and European energy markets were already in uh, turmoil before the in-depth review answers have also drastically changed since the team's an unexpected Russian invasion of Ukraine. Even though this first and uh, this is first and foremost is a humanitarian crisis. It has also affected the energy markets and energy policies in Europe. It reminds us of how important stable access to energy is and the value of balanced energy policies that also contributes to the security in turbulent times. I believe the current situation highlights even more Norway's special position as the biggest producer and only net exporter of oil and gas in Europe. From a central and reliable supplier of energy to our European neighbors and partners. From our perspective, it is essential to contribute to improving Europe's resilience to the negative invasion of Ukraine. We work closely with EU, EU member states and UK in the energy field. A manifest of this was the agreement between EU Vice President Timmermans and myself last week, where we decided to deepen our strong long-term energy partnership. Highlighting the importance that we are neighbors, partners and allies who share common fundamental values climate objectives and regulatory frameworks. I can assure you that Norwegian oil and gas production companies are doing the best to deliver as much oil and gas as they can in the moment. However, our current export volume of oil and gas would not have been possible without sustained investment in more true for production and export in the years ahead. And I can promise you that Norway will remain a stable and predictable markets will continue also going forward. We are in a fortunate situation when it comes to renewable energy, and we have a long history with abundant, flexible hydropower. But even though we have an almost 100% renewable electricity sector, we are facing some of the same challenges as the rest of Europe. This winter, we start to see sky high electricity that managed just a few years ago. The energy prices are a big challenge both when it comes to costs for households and for the industry. This is high on our political agenda. We have established a benefit scheme and we are now evaluating and reviewing in the past year, looking into ways to secure reliable and affordable supply of electricity going forward. We are connected and affected by the critical situation in the energy markets around us. And we do not have all the answers right now. Another subject that is high on our agenda is to facilitate more renewable electricity production. The Norwegian government has very high ambitions for offshore wind development on the Norwegian continental shelf. We aim to award areas for 30 gigawatts offshore wind by 2040. We also have ambitious climate targets for 2030 and 2050. We cooperate closely with the EU to fulfill our 30, uh, 2030 climate target. And we have several climate meet, uh, mitigating tools that we will contribute to an efficient achievement of our climate targets. CCS will be in Paris agreement. CCS will cut 
emissions in the hard to abate sectors, both safeguard and create jobs, helping us ensure a just transition to net zero. Our full scale demonstration project, Longship, is paving the way for CCS as a crucial decarbonization tool for the industry. The government wants to develop a current value chain for hydrogen, where production, distribution, and usage are developed in parallel. Norway is uh, in a pole position to take part in the development of a market for hydrogen. We have suppliers covering the whole value chain and our natural resources could form the basis for hydrogen produced with low to zero emissions. The government has recently presented our roadmap for a green transition, where we present our ambitions for all these sectors. So lastly, I want to repeat that I really appreciate the work you have done with this report. It is valuable input for our policy making and for the dialogue. So thank you very much. Thank you, uh, Minister Orsland. Uh, we now have time to take some questions from journalists. Uh, just, a, just a few minutes for questions. Uh, we invite the journalists in attendance to send your questions in the Q&A function in the Zoom if you haven't done so, done so already. And do please state your news organization alongside your question. We'll now take uh, a two minute break to, for you to send us your questions. We'll be right back. We're back. Thank you very much for the questions uh, to those journalists who sent them in. We have, we have quite a few. We may not be able to get to all of them, uh, but we'll be as quick as we can in the time we have remaining. Uh, the first one uh, came from, comes from um, Emma Helgevold of uh, Dagens Nerenstiv. Uh, I apologize in advance for my pronunciation. Um, uh, this one is for the, we're going to, uh, this one is for Minister Orsland. The, European Commission recently came out strongly in favour of Norway's continued exploration and production of oil and gas. Is that compatible with the IEA's net zero roadmap? Um, uh, so that one, uh, over to you, uh, Minister Orsland. Exploration and production of oil and gas. So that over to you, Minister 
breached uh, the 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 Norwegian uh, government had uh, energy security in in Europe. We want to develop and not uh, dismantle the the, the the activity in Norwegian continental shelf. And uh, we have uh, focus and uh, uh, want to to also have a transition in the in the oil and gas sector for the coming years. We can produce uh, hydrogen. We can uh, use the competence in uh, in the oil and gas uh, sector to develop further on the carbon capture and storage. We have uh, uh, offshore mining and very interesting uh, things. So I think that can uh, handle the, the emissions uh, goal also to develop the, the oil and gas sector with low emissions. But it's very important that uh, the Norwegian oil and gas companies uh, cut their emissions uh, uh, with the target that the, the government had uh, had uh, set for the for the sector by fifty percent in uh, twenty thirty. Thank you, Minister Osland. Um, the next question uh, is about uh, carbon capture. Uh, so, what is the role of carbon capture uh, utilization and storage uh, in meeting Norway's climate tar targets? Um, and this one is for uh, Ms. Reddy. Um, well, thank you for the question. So. Um, Basically, CCUS will be instrumental to, to meeting Norway's targets, and in fact, it will be nearly impossible for Norway to meet its targets um, based on domestic uh, emissions reductions without CCUS. So the carbon tax, which was introduced in 1991, has been an important driver for a while for CCUS development in Norway, but the, the more recent work that the government has been doing to, to jumpstart the technology, notably with the Longship project that has been mentioned a few times already, um, is going to make a huge difference. Um, it encompasses the sort of full value chain from capture to, um, to transport to storage. Um, and though it comes with a sizable cost um, the, the, uh, from the, for the public budget, the government is putting a lot of money into it, it will represent an important proof of concept for future projects, um, both within Norway, in Europe, and, and globally. Um, and within Norway, it'll be important in particular for industrial sectors like oil and gas production, cement production, waste incineration, and a number of others. So, so we really do see it as an invaluable tool for Norway to meet its, its climate targets. Thank you, Ms. Reddy. Um, and now our last question, the last one we have time for. Uh, this is, a, in fact, another one from Dagens Nerensliv. Um, the EU Commission uh, recently came out strongly in favor of Norway's, con sorry, no, uh, that's the previous question. Uh, emissions from Norway's oil and gas production are lower than the global average, and Norway is also planning to lower those further thanks to the electrification of more oil and gas platforms. Does that make Norway more suited to keep exploring for and producing oil and gas than other producing nations? Uh, over to you, Dr. Birol. Uh, thank you very much. And it is a... Uh, uh a question that we are uh, facing uh, almost on a, a daily basis. Uh, the world will need oil and gas in the future. Even in our IEA net zero roadmap uh, 2050, we will still uh, need uh, oil and gas for the sectors that the oil and gas can uh, need to be used is a key input and very difficult to substitute. So net zero 2050 doesn't mean uh, zero oil, zero gas. There will be some oil, there will be some uh, gas needed, but much, much lower than today. However, about 20% of the global energy uh, uh, demand uh, will come from oil plus gas. And of course, uh, it is better for the world, in my view. This comes from a country which has much lower uh, carbon uh, footprint, which is a reliable supplier, AAA supplier, such as uh, Norway. And when we look at the Norway's uh, uh, oil and gas industry's track record, it is uh, really excellent. As Mr. Minister mentioned, uh, there is still uh, some uh, room to uh, improve. 
making much better, and the government has st uh, strict targets to reach. Uh, but even uh, in the current context, the, uh, uh, the methane, for example, uh, from the natural gas uh, sector in uh, Norway is exemplary for many other countries that we are uh, showing. But more room to improve uh, current uh, production uh, in terms of the reducing the oil and gas uh, sectors, uh, carbon and methane emissions. Uh, but again, I would like to prefer that the world gets uh, years and years later oil and gas from uh, countries uh, such as Norway on one hand uh, reduces its uh, emissions from oil and gas sector substantially and at the same time uh, being a, a reliable uh, supplier uh, which uh, Norway uh, uh, proved once and uh, once uh, again. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Dr. Birrell, um, and thank you to Minister Osland uh, and to Ms. Reddy uh, for your contributions. Um, thank you to the journalists for your questions, and thank you to everyone uh, following this event uh, live online for your interest in our work. That concludes our press conference for today. Thank you and goodbye. <laughs>